And now I invite Martin Scheffer um, to come to the floor. Um, Martin is from Wageningen University. I think everybody of you knows him very well. Um, well, Martin will talk about shallow lakes, and I'm sure he will also give some examples from South America. Thank you. Uh, wonderful to be introduced by my old teacher from the University in Utrecht, in a hall where there is my, the one that hired me for my first job, Harry Hosper, and there are students and many ex-students, I, 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 friends and colleagues, a very special audience to me. So I should talk about a very special project, uh, which is the SALGA project, South American Lake Gradient Analysis, a project in which we had many, many people involved. Um, for me, it was a, I, I learned a lot from this project in two senses. First of all, it was unlike any other project that I have uh, been involved in, in terms of how it worked uh, uh, from the point of social interactions uh, and, and, and how it was set up. In most projects, you get a, a lot of money and then you have to divide it amongst a lot of people and, uh, and it works from that part. You basically first have the money and then you look for the people. In this case we had almost no money and still we got a lot of people. So how did that work? Um, <clears throat> well, Brian Moss that will talk after me and me and Eric have two things in common. One is that we are interested in lakes. Another thing is that we were all invited to give a course on limnology in different years by this person, Nestor Maceo, in Uruguay. And I think that all got us interested very much in, uh, in that continent, in the people there that were very nice, but also in the lakes, uh, beautiful lakes in Uruguay we saw, but there are, there are many lakes there. Um, talking to Nestor Maceo, uh, at some point we got the idea to do a climate project there, the so-called space for time replacement. Right? The basic idea is how do I know what will happen to a lake if the climate gets warmer? Well, look for the same lake in a place where the climate is already warmer. So we look for the same lake, this size, this depth, everything more or less the same, but in a different climate and, and compare them. And the idea is that that would give you a clue what climate does two lakes. So in Holland um, we, we wrote two projects, two small projects uh, with NVO, uh, the, the tropical part of NVO, the, the Science Foundation, and they both got funded and each project was for one PhD student. On the left you see Sarian Kosten and she is for me also on the left, but for you on the right in the hall, and she'll be around uh, also tomorrow. She'll give a presentation. Um, you'll see s several of the results that I very briefly touch upon. You'll see them later uh, today, tomorrow, and you can talk to the people. So if it goes too fast, don't worry. On the right, you see Giselle Lasserot. She is at this moment uh, in Uruguay, but you can see her in Holland on the 6th of April when both Sarian and Giselle and Carla Kruk defend their PhD thesis on climate effects on lakes in, uh, in Wageningen. So you're all invited if you'd like to see the ceremony there and hear some. Uh, it's open to everyone. You don't have to pay 200 euros. Uh, to, you can just enter and, and see the discussion, meet the people. Uh, so the 6th of April, they will defend. Well, it's one thing to, to think, okay, now I have those two strong girls and they can sample all those like lakes on the, clim on the, on the climate gradient and, and do this work, but of course you immediately realize uh, when you talk about, uh, when, you, when you mention that plan to their mothers, they say, what are you thinking? And you, they need some bodyguards, they need some help, and that is uh, exactly uh, what, uh, what we also thought, and some people have been very important in helping on that. In, uh, this is Nestor Maceo again. Here we have uh, Vera, Hussar and Coca that uh, helped us develop the project, helped us uh, not only making the plan of the sampling but also connecting 
to different on-the-ground uh, groups that would pre-select lakes and go into the fields with uh, Sarian and Giselle uh, on a conference in, uh, in Brazil, uh, a conference of the, uh, the Brazilian uh, limnologists. That's huge, by the way, one and a half thousand limnologists only in Brazil come to the conference and, and present. So we, we met there and we started making plans. And the way it goes, you, know, you have a small notebook, you start scribbling, and this is the, actually the page from this, from this notebook. And you see all the, the ideas we had, and one of the things you read there uh, is very small, but it says, we'll sample one, 100 lakes, and it'll take us one day for each lake. Yeah. Some of those things, later you find out that you were very optimistic um, at the start. Of course, it was much more work. Uh, but fortunately, we had help by many people, not only um, in the field work, which of course was very important, but al also in, uh, in helping interpret the data. So you see uh, some uh, international renowned specialist in stable isotopes, uh, Luc de Meester, who's also here, uh, Andy Lotter, who's also here, um, many people from Europe, uh, from South America, helped in this project, and we don't, didn't have any funding for that. We only had the funding for the two PhD students. So uh, we thought people should have something in return. So the idea was we'll share the data with everyone. There'll be, the results will be everyone's property. Everybody can publish about the data and has access to the data. But of course, you have to be careful there. So we had this code of ethics, uh, which basically says that uh, the PhD students go first, and then anybody can uh, publish about the data when they've helped, but they should always ask uh, it, and they should always open up to all this community to be a co-author if they really contribute. And that worked really well, because we got lots of people uh, discussing about results, uh, interpreting data. So that was, that was really nice, and it was really an eye-opener, I think, to all of us that we got this huge community working basically for free on, uh, on this very nice project. So a few impressions from the fields. How does it look? Well, you need a good car because you have to, to go through all kinds of places that are unlike what we usually see in Holland. You need a boat. Um, you need a field laboratory. So we had those, those in, in the most incredible places. You see Giselle working, uh, observed by a very curious uh, local person. Um, but also we had a tent, so if there wasn't a shed that we could borrow, we just put up a tent and, and tried to do as, as, as well as possible the analysis there. It was much more work than we thought. So here you see the celebration with some champagne uh, of 13 lakes terminated, uh, done, but 87 still waiting, and they were pretty tired already by that, by that point. So it was really a huge thing, and here you see what it does to people. They start writing graffiti. This is in the south saying that after 3,200 kilometers, the Salga team arrived in the south um, from the north of Brazil to the south, where actually there are no maps. Uh, you have to do the satellite navigation, uh, Google Earth, things on, uh, and look where you are, trying to find those lakes at the end of the road and really the end of the road was like here, it looks a bit grim but very nice people everywhere telling amazing stories. Well just talk to Sarian and you'll hear very, very nice stories that, uh, that were told. So we had from the equator basically very hot lakes to the south, where it was rainy and, and cold, a tremendous temperature gradient. You cannot get such a gradient uh, with the same kind of lakes uh, in many places in the world. If you, go for, if you look in Europe, you go to very different lakes if you, come, if you go from Finland to, to Spain or, or Morocco. And the South American continent is so nice because you have the same kind of shallow lakes along the coast um, that you can really compare, of course, you can never really compare it, it's, it's a quite good set of lakes across a climate gradient. So what did we learn? Um, 
many things. I picked out only five. Um, I don't want to be too repetitive with what Eric has said and what no doubt uh, Brian is going to say, so I'll just focus on what we found in those data. Uh, one interesting thing is that uh, it looks like, um, okay, when it gets warm, you get more small fish, the bad guys that we've, we've, we've heard. But it appears to be like you have either a lot of small or it's mainly big. And there have been models for that. And also there has been an experimental uh, evidence that uh, in a lake which is dominated by um, small fish, those are the small fish, and you don't like that, you start fishing the small fish, and then you leave the lake alone, it remains in a state where it's a more equal balance between the small and the, and the big fish. So that's, that's an indicator for uh, alternative stable states, but in this case not to do with uh, vegetation, water clarity, but with the internal uh, feedback in the fish community. Now, there are other kinds of evidence that you can uh, look for if, if you look at the field data for alternative stable states. One is that you have a sudden switch. Well, that is, for instance, observed in cod, kabayao, uh, crashing at some point uh, outside the coast of uh, Canada. And there is also a famous other example, Lake Victoria, where here you already had Nile perch, but nothing really happened until this year when suddenly it took over and it dominated the state. So we have um, those kind of sharp regime shifts in uh, size dominance, that it's either dominated by the big ones, the colts or the Nile perch, the predators, or dominated by small fish. So what about this? There was no publication about that, but we find a kind of pattern like that in the Salga data. Many lakes dominated by small fish, those ones, and there are also lakes dominated by big fish. Um, this is mainly in warm water, this is mainly in cold water, as Eric also said. Another way of looking at it is suppose you plot some variable, what is the response of the system? Do you find different relationships? Whoops. And yes, we also find that. You find the small fish dominated systems in warm conditions and large fish dominated systems, mainly in cold conditions. So what does it mean? It means that uh, the structure of fish communities might also switch in, an, in a discrete way. This is true probably for marine fish, but also for freshwater fish. And it might be that if it's warmer, you have a higher chance that by some pressure, eutrophication, fishing, you switch the lake to a small fish dominated situation which is bad news for the zooplankton, as Eric already told. So let me say something about uh, the role of fish in the trophic, uh, in the trophic cascade. The original idea, the, the well-known idea, is that the big fish eat the small ones. And this is uh, also a saying in uh, um, the, the big ones dominate the, the small ones, um, illustrated by this famous picture. How do you know what the fish eats? Well, you can analyze the chemistry of the fish. You can look at the stable isotopes, in this case the, the different forms of the different species, as they say, of nitrogen. Um, and uh, from that you can conclude how high in the food chain it has been foraging. It's like an, it's an indicator. And we looked at that in the lakes and we looked at how strong the correlation is between the size of a fish and its position in the food web. And what you see is that in cold lakes there is a good correlation, there is a steep gradient, so the big fish eat higher in the food web than the small fish. But actually in warm lakes that's not the case. If you see a big fish or a small fish it doesn't tell you anything about what they eat. So the, the typical big predator uh, fish is not what you see in, uh, in warmer lakes. They, they start becoming less escivorous. Now, the bad news uh, of having a lot of small fish is that small fish are very good in eating, eliminating zooplankton. Um, 
there were already studies suggesting that in warm water you'd never see the big Daphnia that we like so much. And we actually also saw this along our gradient. Um, you see that the big, the bodies, the large body sizes, you find them in the colder lakes. And if you go to the equator, the, the average body size of the cladocerans is smaller. Uh, interestingly, this is not the case for rotifers or copepods or for macrophyte associated Cladocera, you find those a lot in some lakes with, with vegetation, but it's not a systematic pattern with the, the climatic gradient. So uh, we think that really fish is the reason, the fact that you have so many small fish is the reason that when it gets warm, you don't see a whole lot of big zooplankton. Why? First of all, because we don't see the, the body size gradient in all zooplankton groups. We see them in the pelagic cladocerans that are out in the open water and that you would suspect are most vulnerable to fish, but we don't see them in the, the rotifers or, the, or, or other uh, zooplankton that we don't think are, are so sensitive to fish. Another reason is that simply we find a very good correlation between the fraction of small fish in a lake and the um, body size of zooplankton. And that's, that's a correlation, and correlations which is always tricky. But there are some examples in which, even in a warm climate, the fish uh, left the lake. For instance, they died because of uh, an oxic situation. And in such lakes, you see the large Daphnia. So yes, they can be very happy in the tropics. They like it, but usually don't, you don't see them, and it's because of the fish. So when it gets warm, you get the bad guys, the small fish, fish tends to become smaller, and this eliminates the larger zooplankton, which you need if you want to control the phytoplankton. Now, I come to some results that I find very interesting, and Sarian and Kostin will talk more about it. Tomorrow, um, one uh, paper that will be published this year in uh, Biogeochemical Cycles uh, shows that cold lakes appear to be carbon sinks. They store carbon, whereas warm lakes are more emitting carbon. They're less storing carbon. And how, how can you check that? Well, you can look at how much carbon there is in the water, how much inorganic carbon, and how that is uh, relative to the, uh, to the atmosphere. So you can see whether lakes are undersaturated or oversaturated. When they're oversaturated, there is, there is carbon to, trying to bubble out of the system, so to say. When they're undersaturated, they're sucking in carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and there is a, a very systematic relationship there. Um, experiments uh, that, uh, that are done now in the laboratory uh, by, uh, by Annelies, who is sitting next to Sarian. No? The, 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 so people can ask you a question. She has very nice experimental results showing the pointing in the same direction. And it's interesting because it means that if you warm lakes, they start emitting CO2, and because of that, they contribute to global warming. And that was a quite new idea. Um, there is, of course, a lot of interest in the effect of CO2 on temperature, but also on the effect of temperature on CO2, because if the Earth becomes warmer, it starts emitting more CO2 itself. So there is a positive feedback there um, that in a, not at all in a limnological literature. We were not focusing on that so much, but, but uh, we are estimating actually that this feedback gives a 50% boost. So if you put one ton of CO2 in the atmosphere, it becomes warmer, and because of that, the Earth gives you half a ton for free, extra. That's an interesting idea. So it's really a complex web of feedbacks that are not uh, really included in the IPCC projections because all those temperature effects on CO2 are very uncertain. And we have a problem in general in, in the world and also in IPCC that we take account for the things that we can compute, but there are some things that we cannot compute, and then we leave them out. 
for instance, in the case of the IPCC, they cannot compute how fast the ice will slide into the sea uh, with higher temperature. They can compute the melting of the ice, but not the sliding, so it's not in the models. The same is true for the feedback of Earth temperature on CO2. We know it's there, but we don't know how big it is, so it's, it's not in the, in the models. And it's an interesting idea that lakes might be important in this. And also, it's an interesting idea to ask how can we perhaps alt alter that? Can we, can we help mitigate global warming by managing our lakes, for instance, in certain ways? Now, the, the fact that warmer lakes don't store carbon means that actually they, they are, there, there is more decomposition Decomposition increases faster with temperature than photosynthesis. That's why the, the net balance goes towards decomposition. So they don't store carbon, it, and that's because of more recycling. The same that we saw in the, in the talk by Eric Jeppesen. If it's warmer, you get more recycling, but not only of, C, of carbon, of course, but also of the nutrients that are locked in the organic biomass. So if it gets warmer, you, the lake releases carbon, but also the sediments release more nutrients. You get an increased recycling of nutrients. And that's only one of the reasons that uh, we get to, the, I think, the most important uh, point here, especially for this day from a point of view of, of management. Warming amplifies eutrophication effects. Uh, Eric Jeppesen has also mentioned the same thing. Several very interesting new results point at that. Uh, for instance, uh, Sarian Kosten has, has uh, addressed, amongst other questions, also the question, uh, okay, macrophyte, submerged macrophyte uh, dominance in lakes. Um, there is a critical nutrient limit for that. But uh, what about temperature? So given uh, uh, that we, uh, we have a lot of lakes and we actually for this combined our lakes together with the data set of Eric Jeppesen, American lakes, and we found that if you have more frost days, you can have higher phosphorus levels and still have macrophytes. So if the winters get milder, it looks like uh, we need to go to lower phosphorus levels if we want to maintain our macrophytes, our vegetation dominance in lakes. <clears throat> then a really clear pattern here for cyanobacteria, increase of temperature, increased percentage of cyanobacteria in the lakes. Now it's always tricky to interpret the pattern because maybe with temperature you also get more nutrients. Well, we, we selected our data in such a way that there is not a correlation between nutrients um, and temperature. But also you can look at the two dimensions together. Here we look at temperature and there, for instance, phosphorus. And you see that both phosphorus and temperature contribute to the percentage of cyanobacteria in a lake. And it boils down from a management point of view to the conclusion that if you want to maintain the same risk of cyanobacteria in a warmer climate, you have to go further down with your phosphorus level in the lake. And also with the loading, because if you, if you think a bit more about the causality here, and this fits again into what Eric has been saying, okay, we, we find that the higher temperature gives you a higher probability of cyanobacteria, even at the same nutrient level. But you don't get the same nutrient level because the temperature actually also leads to more nutrient recycling from the sediment because of the, the higher decomposition that, uh, that what we saw before. Also, you may have a higher influx of nutrients from the water, from the catchment, uh, depending a bit on, on the particular area where you are. So you'll tend to get more nutrients. Now, more nutrients give you higher biomass of phytoplankton in general, especially if you have more small fish too, which was also an effect of temperature. So it all works in the same direction, right? Now, if you have a higher algal biomass, Okay, you can have higher total biomass of cyanobacteria because there is, there is more biomass. But also, if there is a higher algal biomass, uh, the conditions underwater are more shady. 
and there is one quite systematic difference between cyanobacteria and other algae, and that is that the cyanobacteria tend to be more tolerant to shade. So if you get more phytoplankton biomass in, two, in, in total, the cyanobacteria get a relative better competitive position. So you get more cyanobacteria dominance and higher biomass because of the higher uh, amount of nutrients. So you see that there are, there are different things, different roads, all leading in the same direction. Uh, I haven't mentioned the floating plants, but we have Jordi Netten here that has very nice results about floating plants, to showing that uh, it's more or less the same story. They're, they seem to be promoted by higher temperatures, and also they benefit, of course, from higher uh, nutrient availability at higher temperatures, because they are, they are the better competitors uh, in, in small ponds and ditches when the nutrient levels are high. So warming amplifies eutrophication. We've seen that uh, macrophyte dominance is less likely if, it gets, if you have less frost days. We have a higher probability of cyanobacterial dominance. We also have higher nutrient levels uh, in general uh, with the same loading. And we have higher probabilities of getting floating plant dominance. So that's good news in a sense because um, we know about eutrophication. We've studied that for years, and we have a, a fantastic uh, uh, assortment of ways to combat eutrophication. So we can use all that. And the take-home mes message, I think, is uh, that measures against eutrophication are the best way to prepare for global warming. And there is another reason why this is a very good outcome in a sense, very practical, because it's a no regret measure. You, know, you could say, why should we do, invest all this money, do all these things if, in case we get climate change? Uh, as, uh, as Eric said, it's a, it's a bloody cold winter now. Maybe there is no climate change. Who knows? Well, you will never regret taking more measures against eutrophication. And that's, that's not always the case, but in this particular case of fresh water management, I think we are in a very, very uh, clear situation. It's quite clear what we have to do. There are many details that, that, are, that have to be resolved in this whole uh, climate story, but the emerging picture is a clear one, and luckily uh, it, it's, it's one that we can, we can use very well uh, for our future water management. Thanks. Thank you very much, Martin, for the interesting example from South America and also for the positive note with which you ended. So uh, we all have to work even harder to, uh, to pre prepare for warming, but we are already doing it. That's the good news. So there is, again, uh, time for a few questions, short questions, please. Any? Will you? Yes, please. Um, that is, that is be because um, uh, all molecules uh, exist in several forms, and some are slightly lighter than the others. They do, they behave chemically as the same, as the same thing. But uh, because some are slightly lighter than others, um, many reactions preferably take more of one of the isotopic variants than of the others. For instance, evaporation. It's easy to understand, goes, goes easier for the lighter uh, oxygen, w water with lighter oxygen, than for the heavier. So you see that evaporated water has a different isotopic structure than non-evaporated water. Well, the same happens, for instance, uh, with the digestion of food. Uh, and you see that the, the isotopic signature of uh, nitrogen changes from, uh, say, a grass to a rabbit to a fox each time a certain step, and from that you can uh, derive how high in the food chain uh, an animal has been foraging by just looking at, for instance, its blood or, or some part, to, and, then, and then look at the nitrogen signature. Now, of course, it is a bit tricky because if the grass, to start with, had a different isotopic signature, 
in two different situations, you cannot compare. So you have always to correct for the baseline isotopic uh, composition. And um, in, in our case, uh, this is the reason why we ha have not looked for the absolute isotopic uh, concentration, but for the slope. How f fast does the isotopic composition change with the size of a fish? And then we see that it doesn't change in the tropics, so all of them apparently are foraging in the same uh, level in the food web, but in cold waters, the big ones are predators. Yeah. It means uh, if, if, if you take two fishes from the same lake, a small, small one and a big one, and they have uh, the same nitrogen isotopic composition, it means that they have probably eaten on average uh, the s at the same level of the food web. They have both been vegetarian or some, or, or some mix. But when you see that the big fish has a, a very different from the small fish, you see that they have, the big fish has really uh, been a predator and the small fish has been a, a vegetarian, so to say, or closer to that. Thank you for this explanation. Uh, it's a very short question, maybe. Okay, go ahead, last one. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a good question. There is almost no lake in the world, right? So, so would uh, lakes contribute anything to the, to the global carbon balance? And the answer is, uh, surprisingly, yes. And the reason is that uh, lakes take a very special position in the landscape. Lakes are collecting uh, organic carbon and nutrients from a whole watershed. And they're like hotspots of carbon processing. Um, the, the first time that was found out was basically for the for the Amazon, the role of the of the water, where they had been measuring uh, with uh, very uh, elaborate structures how much carbon came out and how much went into the rainforest. And they found that a lot of carbon goes into the rainforest. So they said, okay, great, the, the rainforests are are locking carbon, but they are not because there is no accumulation of carbon. There is almost no soil. And then came an aquatic ecologist and looked in the Amazon River, and it's full of carbon going to the ocean. So the water uh, is the, the, the water uh, streams, uh, and lakes, and groundwater are very important uh, transporters of carbon. And then when it comes into a lake, that is a reactor. That it's, it, it's not a huge thing in the in, in the world's. Uh, carbon balance, but it's, it's surprisingly more strongly than you would think, and that's why also a, a journal like uh, Global Biogeochemical Cycles was interested. So I would suggest that in the coffee break you go and see Sarian, because this is really her, her work, and, and she knows much more about it than, uh, than me. Thank you very much. And